one, smoke one. When you live like this, you're supposed to party. Roll one, smoke one, and we all just having fun. So we just roll one, smoke one. Hey, this is Daniel Montero. We're back at EVB Oakland. It's May uh, 14th, yeah, it's March 2019. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Ramon Padre Mu, for giving us the opportunity to uh, rock here at this uh, fundraiser for expungement, cannabis expungement. And I'm excited today because I'm here with the beautiful uh, cannabis queen, Reese, uh, from Posh Green Delivery. She is the owner, and she has a thick history um, in our cannabis culture. And many of us have been through what you really can't duplicate now because there is no more uh, drug war, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, we've done regulated it and here we are shifting to this new landscape. And like I was mentioning to you earlier, I really admire everything that you're doing as a strong black woman because the odds, are, odds aren't exactly in your favor. And I like how you use your, your charisma, you use your, uh, your, your sexuality as a woman, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> really, to, to really promote I'm what you're I'm naturally doing. sexy, I can't turn that off. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So what, I, what I'd like to do before we go any further is really um, share with the audience, you know, how you grew up, and, you know, like through high school, and then once we get through that, how cannabis first intersected your life. Okay, so San Francisco, California. Um, I grew up in the 70s, 80s, basically. Um, High school was uh, pretty rough um, because that's kind of like when the war on drugs hit, which is when it affected my family. Um, my mom had started using and my dad had got locked up for a kingpin charge for over 12 years for selling drugs. So, Say kingpin um, charge? Yeah. So, um, Do you mind if I ask what that means? That means that he was selling like lots and lots of cocaine, basically. Um, How yeah. old were you at the time? Uh, when that happened, I was 12, and my life would never be the same. <laughs> I mean, your daddy's gone, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he was gone, mom was on drugs, family was on drugs, and you know, but my dad always put like really good, good, and still really good things in, in us, you know, he was a hard worker himself, he just had a different life, and he was a great dad, and he was a regular father that wanted nothing but the best for his kids, like any other person, he just didn't have the degree, and the and the American dream that we foresee as American dream at the time. But so that's what made me really resilient and never give up because he always pressed really great goals and morals into us and loyalty. When uh, you were 12, were you aware of everything that was going on at the time? Oh yeah, I knew my dad sold drugs. I knew we were different. I knew that we, we were not like the people in our neighborhood. I knew my dad didn't go to a regular job. Um, I was I was counting his money when I was in the second grade and hiding it for him. Like I knew what was going on definitely. Was he the first person you smoked weed with? <laughs> oh, my dad don't do drugs. He would never let his kids do any drinking or drugs. Really? Uh, when he found out I was doing drugs, it was like we were in New Orleans Essence Festival. I was like had an eight-year-old son already, and I was like old enough and he caught me and he's like a person that's very disappointed and very hard so he's not with the sleeve chair the same room with your kids dad if you're not married he's he's very strict like it's not what people think when they sell drugs he's very strict <laughs> when did you first start smoking cannabis um moved to charlotte new city having north anxiety carolina? north carolina having anxiety um, How old were you? I was like I was like 29 when I first started smoking cannabis. I didn't really have time to smoke cannabis in high school because my friends all smoked and I was like, why are you smoking so much weed? We were laughing about that today because I was focused on surviving and I had no food some days, you know, and I had bigger problems. So getting high was like, sometimes it's people's first thing, but because I seen it destroy my family, it was like something I didn't go to when you know, when I was sad or whatever. So I didn't start doing cannabis until I developed anxiety. And that's it. And why did you move to North Carolina? Um, to go to Harris School and open a hair salon yeah. Yeah. and buy a home, which I all lost all of that. But guess what? The bounce back is great. <laughs> and you started hustling cannabis in your yeah. younger years. Yeah. So um, while I was um, out of state, I met a lot of people, a lot of guys, and um, I was just. I didn't have a lot. I had lost everything. My dad went to jail. My son's father turned informant on my dad and then lied. So I lost everything. And it was just like mind blowing for me, for uh, my son's father to do this to a family and to lie and to know we're going to be out in the street. And um, then, it, then my dad went to jail again. And that's when he actually 
hadn't been selling drugs and retired and, and, and tried to do a favor for somebody that he shouldn't have done because of his connections, and he's still in jail to this day, and it's 12 years later. Um, so I, I lost the house, moved to Atlanta. I was going there a lot, and you know, I'm cute. So a lot of guys would, I always attracted like ball players or drug dealers, so they always ask where the weed at. So and that that's why I respect you, so because you've always been able to leverage like that so, to your advantage too, you know what I'm So saying? guess what, I'm not trying to go out with you, how can we get some money together, it was always me, because I, I didn't have anything, I was trying to take care of my son, and I'm not the kind of person that's gonna go strip at a strip club, um, because that's just not my personality. So I said, let's get this money. I knew how to sell drugs. I've seen it, I see my dad be good at it, and uh, I knew the mistakes he did make. <laughs> And that's the trust in people and working with too many people. And at what point did you realize you were good at selling weed? I know I had two customers when I moved back to California and I was pulling in over 10,000 a week. Off of weed? Yes, black market. And I don't even do that now. I don't even <laughs> nowhere near that right now. But I was pulling in over 10 grand a week, loyal clients, loyal clientele, and I was so good I wasn't even touching the weed. I would just make sure it was the right weed, and I had it all set up where it was. It was a good deal. It was a good. It was. It was good. I never was in the same room, but actually approving it. Damn. What did it take to be a cannabis entrepreneur back then? A successful cannabis entrepreneur, in your opinion? What one before black market? When black before market? before the days of today. Well, with what loyalty, was you, you knew the people that didn't like you. Knew the people you were dealing with. Now you don't know who who's coming for you. You don't know who's who likes you, you don't know what can happen. At least I chose the people I wanted to work with and I chose who knew what I did. Now it's on the open, I have no control over it. It's a lot of people that are bigger than me that are intimidated by the fact that I've gotten this far being a sole proprietor, the only woman is still on my company. Um, and they ask how I do it and I say from manifestation in God and just keep believing in myself and then believing in what I know he, what's here for me and I know I don't know how I, I know how I got here, but this wasn't my dream. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> I like how you do the daily devotionals on your social media. That's really dope. And at what point did you realize in your cannabis career that you had to, to make the switch towards regulated activity? Um, when it was so many people just, it, it, it didn't even, I didn't even take it serious what I was doing. I studied, I studied, I studied, I learned, and then when it came regulated, I was like, fuck, I really got serious. I'm like, all these people are counting me out. I gotta do this, just because I wanted to prove people wrong more so. So people, when you guys are hating on people, you really feel people to go harder, you just don't know it. So the good way to not make somebody go harder is just not to hate because the reason why I'm here now is because of so many naysayers, so many things I hear in the street, so many people that didn't want to see me win, so many things, and for that reason, I could have won in the other job I was doing. I was winning. I was charging $300 an hour to do my own company, 150 to 300. For your I hair? Was, for my hair, and I was booked with Neiman and different things. Like, I work with the greatest, so therefore, it wasn't it. It's just that when it's time, nobody wants to see me win because I look different than the normal people in the cannabis game. I didn't look like, oh, you're not going to get out there and work hard. I work hard, and most of y'all looking cute. And no one believed in me, and I believed in me, and I kept going, and now I made it. Sober proprietor, I can't believe it, but God can do things that you cannot believe all the time. Now, why Posh Green? Why the name, and how did you get started with Posh Green? Well... I had a boutique called Posh and Privilege, so I sold clothes online, so I had a previous business also. So it was called Posh and Privilege, and so we already had an Instagram with Posh and Privilege, so I just took off the privilege part, which is still my email, when people email me for business, posh with two H's and privilege at Gmail, and I was like, Posh Green, I want something upscale, it's green, Posh Green, and so that's how Posh Green, and then we developed the logo, the first logo, guy, I thought it was the shit, now I look back at it like, what the fuck oh, was I growing. thinking, right? My first website, I thought the shit was bomb, like, what the fuck, but I built all this shit myself, and then uh, when Canada Royalty came in, they, they gave me a budget, and we went hard on the logos, the project logo and the regular logo, so I was, I was blessed. And tell us about, you got a storefront now and a delivery service? Yes. So, licensed delivery service. We got our, um, our, our um, provisional. Yay. Congratulations, the by the way. Yes, yes. And um, 
storefront coming this summer. Been working hard on that. It's really great. It's posh. Um, I designed it myself, so um, wait. We got some things that people haven't seen. We collabing with some great women. Uh, yeah. uh, yummy Karma, we got some um, that no one's seen, and I'm pretty sure once we do it, y'all gonna wanna have it. What does it mean to you to be a strong, young, independent black woman in the cannabis game right now? Um, just being a strong black woman and to be able to show other people you can do it, especially because the statistics was way against me. Um, to just show people you can make it, no matter where you come from, no matter what kind of parents you have, is just important to me. But to be in the cannabis industry and like walk in, before I never claimed my business up until like a year and a half ago when it was time to come go legal and I still didn't tell people because I was like, oh, I don't want to get robbed. I don't know. I was thinking of a lot of crazy right, things right, 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 and I'm yeah. a woman. Right, so. so I was just like, you know, I'm not going to say anything. And then finally, I was like, I need to stand up. I'm the first black woman in California to be sub proprietor of a cannabis delivery and club. I need to like, you know, really, you know, start patting myself on the back and, and people and, and I am humble, but I still need to congratulate myself. Some people don't feel good when you congratulate yourself because they don't feel good about themselves, but I'm going to congratulate myself because I work hard. I don't get much sleep, um, as you can see, because I keep producing things and it's things that I can't even talk about that I'm working on. Your grind is tight. Your hustle game is tight. What advice do you have to other young black women in particular that want to be successful in the cannabis game? As a woman who's been in the cannabis game. I just keep going. I don't take no for an answer. That's what everyone around me say. I don't, I'm the, I don't take no. If it's something I want, I go back three times, four times until I actually get it. Even if everything I've, I've gotten, people told me no, and even if they didn't offer me what I want, they offer me something. So therefore, you gotta believe in yourself and know you can do it and just have confidence. You don't have to come from a lot. I started my business with $16,000. I worked three jobs and I was don't even know how I'm here now to be able to open a dispensary. I do know how I'm here. Manifestation, prayer, and just the, the grace of God and hard, hard long nights. Like, you don't want to work out work the regular person and work 18 to 20 hours a day sometimes, and you don't want to work seven days a week, then this is not for you. But if you got that resilience and you can work and you can go hard, you know, and, and don't give up, you can go. Like, I'm, I'm going to keep it real. Cardi B keeps me going because that lady is a woman. She got a kid and she works. She's working seven days a week. She's flying on two and three planes a day and, and, sh and she don't, she keep going. And I'm like, fuck, if she can do it, I can do it. She got a new baby and she ain't stopping because she knows it's her time. And when you feel it's your time, you gotta put, keep your foot on the gas until, until, until it's not your time, and it, you know? And I want that effect uh, for you to have on other young black women. You're inspiring women right now. Yes, you, know what I'm we, like, you can do whatever you be. You, you can be a boss whatever you uh, do. You don't have to be a boss and own your business. You can be a boss and run a business of somebody else. There are CEOs that run businesses and run companies that make 20, 30 million dollars a year and it's not even their company. It's because of their what they know and how grateful, how uh, how they can go in and take over a room, how they can control the room, how it's not being a boss don't mean you look down on people. Being a boss is that you look at people all the same, but then you are you are delegating, you are giving people jobs that they know what to do best because you don't know everything. So a boss is a person that can delegate right to build a de team and a foundation that can keep growing. Beautiful explanation. I'm really proud of everything that you've done so far, and I, like I said, I, I admire you for your hustle and your work ethic. Now, kind of a little bit out of left field, but what does cannabis culture mean to you? It means, it changed a lot before, it was just like, it's, it means wellness at this point. Before cannabis was like, you know, oh, I need to get, I want to smoke, but I didn't realize that I was getting high or whatever you want to call it, taking my medicine that was helping me get through my day to day, helping me get through the pains and actually helping me focus and think better and think and manifest this life that I have. Um, so I just think like, you know, the culture is wellness. If cannabis is not doing you well, then you need to stop it like anything. If cannabis is taking over your life and you're not doing nothing with your life, then this is not for you. Everybody can do everything. Cannabis should be motivating. It should help you do better, want to create and want, and want to give you, you like willingness to grow and grow. Like, you know what I'm saying? Hell yeah, hell yeah. So this is something that you never thought you'd be doing with Posh Green. It's a new direction no, in your life. I'm into fashion. Thank God fashion and weed combined, because I knew that was going to happen, but thank God. 
You know, I think we've had a great interview, to be honest. Uh, I love the slice of uh, your story that you shared with the audience. Yeah. And I'm grateful for you coming I'm on real quick and giving for, me the time. I'm, I'm happy we finally got together and we got to get here because I've been one to share my story. And so thank you for having me. And I will just, I hope I inspire people, even anybody. Just, you know, if you want it, go get it. Guess what? It's so many, all the billionaires was made here in Cali, number one. San Francisco, uh, Bay Area, number two. And if somebody else, my motto is, if, if it's out there, why can't I have it? That's what, how I look at it. If it's there, you can have it. Most millionaire and billionaires came from shit, so why couldn't you have it? Truth, truth. How can the audience get a hold of you? Um, and Posh Green. Um, we're on Instagram at Posh Green Delivery and also info, I-N-F-O, at poshgreencollective.com. Reese, you're a boss. Thank you for coming Thank on. Thank you so much. You are too. Roll one, smoke one. When you live like this, you're supposed to party. Roll one, smoke one. And we all just having fun. So we just roll one, smoke one. When you live like this, you're supposed to party. Roll one, smoke one.